From Little Mountain Sound in Vancouver, British Columbia, this is Lab Notes. And now here's your host, Russ Hamilton. Hello and welcome to Lab Notes. I am your host, Russ Hamilton. Thank you so much for joining us. Lab Notes is the Connection Lab podcast. If you've been to a Connection Lab workshop or an executive development program or a leadership journey or perhaps another workshop with another methodology, Chances are you took notes, and what we encourage you to do on Lab Notes is to join the show, either in person, on Zoom, or radio, or any way you like, and open those notes. And let's go over the notes you took, the, the notes you took for yourself to find out how was your experience, what was valuable about it, and how is it affecting your practice now. We're going to hear from people at all levels across the spectrum of the marketplace and hear about how they're practicing and how their experience is affecting how they're moving forward and the impact they're trying to have on the world. On this episode, we're going to talk to Kathy Howley. Kathy has been integral to the Connection Lab experience and the development of our process, and we are so grateful to have her on the show. She's in Salida, Colorado. We'll also stop in Plainfield, New Jersey, and we're going to talk to superhero recruiter Saudia Ganey. She's going to tell us about her experience in the Connection Lab program and talk about how she's moved on and how her practice has changed and, and what she's trying to create in her professional communities. We're also, for the first time in Lab Notes, in studio with our first guest right here at Little Mountain Sound in Vancouver, British Columbia. Jim Conrad is going to join us from JCA Communication. He is voiceover extraordinaire. He's a dear friend of mine and has been for many years. He's never done a Connection Lab program, but he's been a part of the conversation for decades. And I'm very excited to hear from him and find out what he finds interesting about what's happening now and also listen to any questions he might have. Let's see how that conversation goes. Let's get started. Thank you for joining us, Kathy Holly. Where are you right now? I am in Salida, Colorado. You are a mom and a partner and a community builder and, oh, shall we say, a senior people executive uh, in, in, in that function. Uh, you have been for a few businesses now. And you are one of the people who's really been influential and integral to the development of the Connection Lab offer. And I'm just very grateful to have you on the program. Ah, oh, that's so nice. Thank yeah, you, Russ. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, so that said, what I like to do is invite people to talk first about their experience as a participant. Because you've had experiences in a variety of levels with this methodology. And... It tends to begin with the experience as a participant. So do you remember when you were on stage and trying to connect with an audience in a Connection Lab workshop? I do. It's funny because I have been through a lot of Connection Labs in different ways. So going back to the very first one is interesting. Um, but I, I do remember it. And I remember the the feelings of it and even in the middle of it feeling very like just knowing deep down that this was a really impactful learning experience, development experience. I'm trying to remember who else was in your group because we're talking, it's got to be six years ago now. Yeah, I was thinking six or seven years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was thinking that Jane was supposed to be there but didn't make it. And Catherine was there for a while but had a family family emergency in the middle of it. Oh, that's right. In the middle of the workshop. Yeah, something mm -hmm. happened. So that yeah. became relevant. How do we show up under stress? Yeah, you absolutely. Know, in, a, in a room where we're all contriving the experience, all of a sudden reality just jams in there and yeah. you know, get a chance to talk about it or not. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just thinking about seeing you up on stage because you've done so much and it's easy for me to blur my memory around this. Mm -hmm. Do you have the one sheet, the, the lab notes menu? I have it. I don't have it in front of me. Oh, did you take I a mean, look at it? Because it's just the yeah. six box model. All it is is a prompt, yeah, yeah. right, for our yes, conversation. So yes, I'm wondering if, you know, between the three primary questions and the three primary relationships and the other questions and distinctions on that menu, mm -hmm. what is triggered for you? What kind of leaps out for you as you're developing your practice as you do every day? Yeah, the first one, uh, the first one jumped out at me. Mm -hmm. Well, I, they're all connected, right? Mm -hmm. So the first one's the first one jumped out at me first. And so a little bit of context. I started a new job about two months ago. Right. And um, have a team of, uh, the people team is, uh, was say, say it's now six people. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, and it's a great team and good people. Um, some, a couple new and a couple who have been there for a long time and they're a really good team. So 
um, my job coming in is to really, you know, help understand the business as it is now. Also, you know, paint a vision for where we want to go and help my team figure out what that means for us, like, and help figure out, like, what does that mean? What do we do every day? What does that mean we do for the business to help us get there? And so that's the, that's the context for me. Sure. Um, the, so how I'm thinking about what I learned from my last role, how do I show up under stress? Well, I, like, I want to come in and just do it all and like, you know, drive forward, know exactly what we need to do and just get it done. Yeah. And knowing that that's like not the right approach, <laughs> I need to make sure that everybody has a voice in the process and that they are as bought in as I am to what it is and that the vision along the way will change because, um, because they, they bring their own unique contributions to it. So that's, that's my recognition that that's how I show up under stress. And I'm tr I'm working now to say like, how do I, I'm working now to make sure I'm showing up in a different way, being inclusive and asking questions and being curious. Um, and also still knowing that we need to get stuff done. So being able to put enough pressure for us to drive forward while also giving the time and space for people to contribute. So that's the one that comes up for me is how do I show up under stress? And then how do I want to show up under stress Yeah, and kind of working, working between those two? Well, that's loud and proud for me. Um, you know, doing a podcast is kind of a new endeavor for me here and organizing and producing and mm. all of those things. So uh, I think in a way, I, I really like, and I think Picasso talked about seeing things as a child, like seeing everything as a new thing all the time. Because that we can get stuck in a rut, you know, we can start the predisposition starts designing how we meet the moment. Uh, the moment can be overdetermined how I show up under stress, how I might choose to. Um, mm. And yet, so in a way, it's new all the time, but you're dealing with something really quite new. Uh, have you noticed anything new about how you're showing up under stress? Um. Yeah, I mean, I'm, because I'm being intentional about it and asking for feedback, I have a couple of people who I'm close enough to that I can ask them for help in this as well. Um, mm. That you know, I, I think I'm showing up to my team in a in a better way, like in a in in a way that helps them see that there's you know a, a level of stress that's productive, right? So a level of stress to know we're going to do something different, and not, and hopefully the engagement to say they can be part of it. Yeah. Um, but there's still a couple things that I would you know that I still, you know, it's a journey, right? So there's still a couple of things where I'm like, oh, I, I really, I wish I would spend a little more time with each person instead of getting, you know, getting caught up in some other things. Like, mm. How do I make sure that I'm spending the time with each person? Um, but then also balancing that with, do they need me to? Is it actually someone else's? Would it be better if someone else was spending that time together? So right. kind of bal balancing that and trying to figure out what the right approach is based on what people like need, what they think they need, what's going to help them be, most successful. Um, so I think I am, I'm being intentional about it, but, um, you know, I haven't, haven't asked my team in the last week or two. Mm. So what comes up for me is the question, whose needs am I in service of here? Cause I sure want to, I want to meet people where they are, but is that my need or theirs? Have they asked for me to come and meet them where they are? Have I introduced that question? Have I asking people to meet me? I'm wondering how, how am I modeling for them? Mm. And whose needs am I in service of? That, that question has come up in several of my coaching conversations recently because yeah. people, in an effort to practice and always with the best of intentions, all of a sudden their needs start to eclipse and they go, you know, I, I had one client who, you know, went on vacation with his wife. This is a while ago now and uh, started asking the waitress at the resort, you know, how long have you worked here and do you go to school and how many other of your schoolmates work here and is the wage good and how long has the hotel been open? And asking question after question after question and this poor young woman is just trying to pour their water and get out. And <laughs> so his wife kicked him under the table and he, he shouted out, what? I'm being curious. Russ told me to be curious. <laughs> <laughs> and... Later, when we talked about it, he, t he, he told me about the whole thing. And he said, should I not be curious? What did I do wrong, Russ? And I said, well, we try to avoid the right and wrong. What my question is, is whose needs are you in service of as you're asking this woman 35 questions in a row? Mm -hmm. And he yeah. said, yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. And the, the interesting part, too, is what I sometimes find is people have an explicit need that they've stated, but it might not be what they actually need. Mm. And that's, that's kind of the tension sometimes. Like, I think that, um, 
my, some people on my team might say they want more time with me. They want more, uh, like they want more time. They have said that, right? They want more time. They want this, they want that. But I don't know if that's actually going to be more beneficial to them because they might be more, bene- they might be, you know, have better benefit by having lesser time and doing more themselves and filling in that space themselves. So mm. there's that balance there of like, where, what is the true need versus the stated need and what's best, what's best for both of us in that situation. So that's the voice of experience. Cause there was a version of you 20 something years ago that when somebody said, I need more time with you, you would have just calendared more time <laughs> thinking that it was literal and only through experience. Are you now saying, okay, so that's, that's entirely possible. And I'm happy to give you more time, but is that true? Yeah. Is what you're asking for more time with me? What would, and so the question I would ask after that is what does that allow for? What would more time with me allow for? Mm-hmm. And then invite them to answer that question. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. How does, what have you noticed about how people who've been through a Connection Lab workshop program or leadership journey, and we should talk about that, Mm. how does that affect the business? I would say, so we, in this particular um, arena, we didn't have a lot of metrics around the before and afters. Um, But I, I will say that I, what I observe with people is that, and the connection lab piece, there's there's two or three benefits that we had from that. So the one of them is those you know people who took the course together had um, much deeper relationships with each other than than they had in the past. So whether they were in the same part of the business or different parts of the business, they built relationships that were deep, and things were that. So then, if they did need to work together in the future, they had that foundation of trust to work on, and like the. Um, that that's a, that's a really you know powerful thing for a business, especially when you have people across the company. I mean, I think at the end we probably had about fifty percent of people who've gone through Connection Lab, and um, so those those relationships are really important. I say the second thing was the language; people speaking the same language. So if you know, if I have taken Connection Lab and I'm talking to someone and I can look at something and I'm like, well, how do you show up under stress? Or I'm asking someone how to show up under stress. Or, Who are you in service of? Just that language, that shared language. Um, is powerful. It helps with shortcuts to things, right? I don't have to have a half hour conversation to you about why it's important to know how you show up under stress. You already know that we can already have that. We can have that conversation and it helps with professional development. Yes. Um, so those are the couple. And then the, the, the third one, and this is related to leadership journey as well, but, but it develops in everybody, um, their leadership skills. So whether they're a formal leader or not, they show up differently, right? They can think more about, um, what they're, you know, all those questions of how do I show up? Why does it matter how I show up? I'm a teammate. Where am I? What's my relationship right now? How do I want to show up? How, what's in service of me? What's in service of my team? Mm-hmm. The ability to kind of translate that into day to day and ask those questions makes teams more effective as well. I'm breathing. Breathe. If you're listening, <laughs> breathe. Fill your lungs from the bottom up. It's so good. What's the difference between leadership and authority in your experience? Um, yeah, leadership is, you, you can't, you can't force it on somebody. So if, um, if I'm, if, if you're following me, I'm leading, right. I can't tell you to lead. I can't control that. Right. Um, whereas authority in theory, I could tell you, you need to do something a certain way. Yeah. And if I have formal authority on something, chances are you do that in that way because I told you to. Right. Um, nice. So you don't decide for me who I follow. No. You do decide what the definition of my job is and what the needs of the business are in context with my relationship with you and the business. Right. So I think that's a really useful distinction too. And I think as you talk about how people develop their leadership skills, that they don't decide for the audience who's following them in terms of their practice. Mm-hmm. Right? They don't control the audience's experience of them. And I work with a lot of people who are still unconsciously trying to control the audience's experience of them. Yeah. And it would be so life would be so much easier. <laughs> wouldn't it? Life <laughs> That's would what be I so, meant. Uh, <laughs> life would be so much easier if I could just reclaim the energy that I'm spending trying to control my audience's experience of me. Mm. And I get to reclaim that energy and reinvest it in the things that I do control, which is the quality of my offer, the quality of my invitation. And what about the new organization? What are you learning? How are you learning? I'm, uh, I'm learning by just being curious. 
not assuming I know anything. This um, organization has a pretty rich history. They're 25 years old. They have, um, they were the founders of the, you know, first in their, in the business really, it really started this industry. Um, and there's a lot of really, there's a lot of depth of knowledge. Like there's a lot of people who've been there um, 15, 20, 25 years. And that's a, it's a lot of experience there. So I'm trying to be just curious, asking lots of questions. Um, I spent the first, <clears throat> I've been there two months so far. And I've spent probably 80% of my time just in listening mode and, you know, listen, observe, pay attention to what's going on. Um, and so it's really, really fascinating. And that's what, <clears throat> what I'm finding is that um, people are really open. They, people like to be seen and heard, right? So every, um, every person I've either talked to one-on-one -on -one or in groups has been appreciative that someone takes the time to understand them, their role, their history. Um, obviously it's not deep because I'm not, I'm not spending hours with each person, but it's, you know, it's starting that relationship and, and starting to understand the history, which then I think can make, you know, the plans that we develop are then much, much more robust because they're built on a, on the, I mean, more clear base than I, than, than if I hadn't been asking the questions. I'm tempted to ask you about the scalability of the three questions but I'm not sure that's a fair question in this context. How does the organization show up under stress? How does it want to show up under stress? What does LRN want to get better at? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I do think it, I do think it's scalable to some degree. I think that, um, I mean, I think that the organization, a, a lot of, a lot of how an organization shows up under stress is around its formal leaders and how the formal leaders show up under stress that kind of, um, waves through the built through the um, through the population, especially if they've been there a long time. Um, it's it's interesting. We have one of our offices that I'd say um, is more steeped in kind of the culture. They're a little bit removed from the um, from the headquarters, mm -hmm. and they've um, like they probably steer a little more how they show up under stress than the formal leaders do because mm. they're so they're so closely connected to the values. And they understand the values and they believe in the values and they believe in the, <clears throat> the we have what's called a leadership framework, which helps people understand that what behaviors are really strong, a strong leader um, exhibits and, and, and strong leaders mean that anyone in the organization is a leader. So they, they, they've really um, em embraced that so, so fully that I think how they show up under stress is, you know, they can take stress a little bit more and then be thoughtful about it and then react to it. They don't, they're not, there's not a quick knee-jerk reaction to stress. Hmm. So, but there's been more change in leadership in the, um, on the headquarters side. And I'd say that the, that stuff, that part of the business, um, probably mimics the leadership styles of the people who've come and gone than, than the, the part that's farther removed. Right. So it's, it's kind of, it's been an interesting I think you can look at an organization and say, how do they show up under stress? Um, there may not be just one answer, though. It may be dependent on your, your context, your geography, your, um, your role, that kind of thing. Oh, my goodness, yes. Well, how many ways can we be under stress? How many forms of stress are there? And mm -hmm. if, it's, if, if, if that's a long list for us as individuals, it has to be a long list for the organization as well. Sure. And it... it it's a really responsible question is what is stressful for me? Because yeah. what's stressful for me might be different than what's stressful for you. Yeah. So you could be totally chill in the, you know, in the kitchen at the office and I'm stressed out about something and I'm panicked because you're not stressed. Yeah. Right. And you're panicked mm -hmm. because I am. Mm -hmm. I come in kind of vibrating. Like, why aren't you more upset about this? And you're like, why are you <laughs> upset at all about this? And all of a sudden, so some consciousness around what is stressful for me. Yeah. And that is scalable to the organization. What is stressful for the organization and how do we diagnose? How do we diagnose what the organization is going through? That question is coming up more and more with the businesses that I work with hmm. because they diagnose and I, you know, I'm reluctant to say it, but really poorly. <laughs> their awareness, their self-awareness as an organization is not great because they don't have a practice of asking these questions. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it is, um, I think you can, I think you can tell by asking questions and talking to people and you can tell what causes people, like you can tell what causes like an individual stress, which is different than the organization. Right. But then you can start seeing a pattern of stress throughout the organization and right. see what causes people stress and what doesn't. 
And I think that is the key part is asking questions and listening to the answers. And I think you can do that in a survey too. Like we, you can, you know, run a survey, you can listen to the, as long as you're really listening and you, people trust it, I think you can get some of that out of, you know, engagement survey type data. I think the pattern is critical. I think specifically to find out, oh, here's how we systematically show up under stress as an enterprise. Isn't that interesting? Mm. Notice the, the similar reactions to similar stresses. I yep. just think that's that that can lead to a more accurate diagnosis. This is fantastic. Yeah, interesting. Kathy Holly, the Chief People Officer at LRN, you are a rock star and very generous talking to me today. Do you have any questions for me? Oh, Russ, I always have questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, um, now that I put you on the spot. <laughs> Um, well, so many of my questions are, well, like, okay, I'll ask you more general. I would say most of my questions for you are personal. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Like, help me, help me figure these things out. Yeah, um, yeah. But, um, the, let, let me just, let me just say this. Cause I, I want to, I want to put in a plug for this. So, um, you've been our partner. So at return path, you were our partner for a number of years, I don't know, maybe six or seven years, um, different iterations of that over time. But I'd say that, um, that that was the, I feel like your partnership was equally as valuable as Connection Lab mm. um, by, by again, just kind of that consistent coaching and development and asking people questions and helping us think differently about things. Um, and then that last, you mentioned leadership journey, we ran the nine month um, leadership program that, um, that I've heard more positive feedback from. And I personally feel like it was the best leadership development experience I've ever been a part of. Um, nine months of, you know, kind of reflection and work and strategic work and individual work and group work and leadership. I mean, just amazing, you know, culminating in a really um, deep personal experience for people that, that I would say the feedback was that their leadership style and their leadership impact was significantly better at the end of that program than it was at the beginning. So I'll mention that and I'll say that that's the value I see in like working with you, working with Connection Lab. And I guess my question for you then, like at a bigger level is like, what are the trends you're seeing? What's, what's happening in the, in the business world that you, um, where you think Connection Lab is, um, can make kind of a unique impact. Mm. So first I'll say thank you for being so generous talking about that. And I totally do agree that our leadership journey program is the watermark in our, my professional experience, uh, changing a group of people and a culture at an organization for the better. Um, the second part is, I feel like the methodology is getting really strong now, and I think it's ready for the larger audience. I think it's ready for more facilitation, more people around the world getting better at leading groups and helping others discover and fulfill their potential as human beings. So this podcast is a part of that. Um, you've been critical in the development of the facilitator development program, uh, your, and uh, specifically your appetite – because you didn't let it go. You're very many years ago, you said, Russ, I want to facilitate this work. And I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. That was like in 1953. And you've been so <laughs> patient. You've been so <laughs> generous. And I remember you like creating docs and just kind of pounding on the door, not letting it go. And now this year, next quarter, we're going to begin the process of developing facilitators and certifying them. So you are you represent what I think is happening around the world, which is a relentless appetite to understand more and to discover and practice a methodology that is actually useful. And when I say that, I mean, look, there's a lot of useful methodologies out there. What I want to do is connect what's valuable about all of them and simplify that process for people who are just coming into this and going, look, they have an appetite to be not only be better people, but better professionals, better partners, better community members. and I think through this framework, there's, there's that opportunity to do that. And I feel like we're responding to an appetite in the world. So in brief, the audience, the global audience is informing the process and the content mm, of Connection yeah. Lab. And for that, I'm as extremely- As it should be. Yeah, as it should be. I have to practice what I ask others to practice. Wow. That's so it. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank I'll let you. you carry on with your day. And I know I will talk to you again soon. And yeah, this has been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Russ. Talk to you soon. Cool. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 
So if you're listening to this and maybe somebody recommended you tune into this podcast, first of all, thank you for doing so. If you want to get more information and find out more about what we're talking about, specifically, you can go to podcast.connectionlaboratory.com. And that has the menu that we discuss with the six box model and some of the questions and distinctions. Also, you can just visit the website, connectionlaboratory.com. It breaks down everything that we offer. It's, it talks about client experience. It talks about all the programs. All the information is there. If you want to find out more, connectionlaboratory.com. That's the place to go. I want to welcome to the program Saudia Ganey. Hello, Saudia. Hi, Russ. Saudia, you are master recruiter. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> she says sure. reluctantly, <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Uh, I'm your audience, so I'm allowed to think whatever I want. And that's what I think is uh, you're also kind of an HR senior. You've got a long history in human resources. You've also got some history Mm -hmm. in diversity and inclusion programs. You kind of ran that program Mm -hmm. for one of the companies that uh, we worked at together. Mm -hmm. Um, And now you're doing recruiting. Yes. Uh, How's it going? Just quickly, what are the headlines? Oh, so far, really great. Hiring a lot of people. Work is great. Outside work is great. So Nice. Good all around, yeah. Good, good, good. Um, we're going to talk about your Connection Lab experience. Okay. Do you remember that? Yes. As a participant, she says emphatically, yes. <laughs> yes, I remember it. I try it to forget, a- but I cannot. A few years ago, but I, I remember. <laughs> yes. You, we had a little executive program mm-hmm. where I would bring in audience. And uh, what do you remember about that experience? What do you remember about being a participant of Connection Lab? Do I remember? Yeah. I remember asking friends to get involved mm-hmm. because we needed audience members. Yes. Um, I remember shouting in a room, <laughs> shouting at you specifically to work on my projection skills. Uh huh. <laughs> and monologues and a lot of conversation. Yes. Okay, I think we're done here. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, shouting in a room. Why were you shouting in a room? <laughs> so that I could be heard. Right. You identified there was something you wanted to get better at around that. Did I? Yes. <laughs> well, because under certain kinds of stress, you can be kind of quiet. Yeah. Yeah. And so one of the things that we wanted to identify and maybe as a practice was what does it mean to shout in a room and get louder and just to hear my own voice be loud? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What else do you remember? Because we did three sessions. We did three executive sessions. Yeah, I remember the first session was um, in a group setting. And so... Right. Yeah, there's a lot of getting in front of the group and engaging with the audience and learning about what the audience needs, essentially. Right. And especially in contrast to what my needs might be. Yeah. And under the stress, the contrived stress of, you know, whatever contrived, whatever content you created, getting up in front of the room and under that stress, whose needs am I in service of here? Right. Yes. Do you remember the games we played? Oh, I remember some of them. I I remember there was one, was it Linger Longer? Yes. And you had to make eye contact uh, with someone and think they, they would raise their hand or raise their hand when they felt seen. And then there was another one where they would put their hand down um, when they were kind of okay for you to move on. Right. Yes. In a service, in service of the exercise was put connection with the audience ahead of your content. Right. And so you got up on stage and the first time you did it, you kind of read what you wrote and did your best to share what you had written. Mm-hmm. And then we talked to you about your experience and you kind of shrugged and said, it is what it is. <laughs> And then we talked to the audience and they kind of shrugged and said, it is what it is. She seems very nice. Mm -hmm. Did you feel seen and heard? And they went, kind of no. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then we we actually created an exercise where you had to get them to raise their hand one at a time before you could give them a sentence of what you'd written. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you had to be curious about them. What color are their eyes? What color are their eyebrows? What shapes do you see? And then invite them silently into a relationship. And when they decided they felt seen, they would raise their hand one at a time. And only when they raised their hand were you allowed to give them one sentence of what you've written. Right. And then you had to go on to the next person and do it again and do it again and do it again. Mm -hmm. And then the game you're talking about, I don't know if you played it or somebody else played it, was Linger Longer. Which is instead of getting permission to begin one sentence, one, one sentence at a time for one person at a time. 
Mm -hmm. You had to linger longer. You had to stay. You had to give a person a thought of what you had written, a sentence, and then invite them into relationship. And when they were ready to let you go, they would raise their hand. Right. So you didn't decide when the relationship was over. Mm -hmm. I remember that too. Yep. What was the second session about? Because the second one was a little more private. Um... What do you remember about that? Because now we're introducing the monologues. Oh, and you did, uh, oh, the movie I remember. Uh, I, I don't remember the movie. Dead Poet Society. Because mm-hmm. that's when you had to raise your voice. Right. And you did that monologue over and over and over again. And the exercise was, what's the demand in that monologue? Right. And I remember when we would, when you would, you know, hand over the sheet of paper with the monologue printed out. And I would have to underline, you know, certain words or phrases and basically try and identify, I believe, what the demand was. What could it be? Yeah. Yeah. And you did. And you started because one of the ways to identify what the call to action could be in a monologue is to circle the action verbs. Oh, do you remember that conversation? The difference between passive and active verbs? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, good. I love that we're taxing your memory here. And not for (laughs) nothing. It's totally fine if you say, Russ, I don't remember any of this. I was kind of wasted, (laughs) which I know wasn't true. But it's okay if the answer is I, I don't remember because... The reason I ask people about what they remember is I'm really curious how we learn anything. How do we learn anything? And it's okay to go, I don't remember what happened. It doesn't mean that I'm not, my behavior hasn't been modified because of that experience. I'm just not conscious of it. Or I remember every single detail about it. I'm really curious about how we learn. And so this is why I ask you and so many other people I'm talking to (laughs) about what you remember and and permission just to go, I, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't remember. So, but slowly we're gathering memory and we figured out goodwill hunting. And now I visualize you circling action verbs and the conversation about passive verbs and action verbs. Do you remember any of that? Um, not, no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I think I remember at one point asking you if a certain word was action verb. Um, right. Or passive. Well, what's the difference between action yeah. verb and passive verb? And I think that's a really valid question. And the only reason it comes up is because uh, you know, I'm just in the room so many times with so many business leaders who use, who think they're calling their teams to action with passive verbs. Right. And, you know, the metaphor I like to use is the, is the, the sergeant in the trench during the, you know, during the fight of the war. And he looks at his platoon and he says, consider attacking. <laughs> <laughs> Which they do. <laughs> and after careful consideration, we've decided not to. It's not necessarily in our best interest. Versus attack, with the action verb versus the passive verb. Yeah, and, and you know, now that you bring it up, I might not remember kind of the specifics of a conversation, but I've seen how it's played out in my career, mm. um, you know, after we had that session. Can you speak to that a little bit? So just, I feel like it's in in little things, even... I don't know, the smallest thing I can think of right now is like writing an email and what's what's the ask in that email and and you know language is super important yes. so are the words I'm using going to elicit some sort of action or is it going to be more something that someone thinks on but doesn't really do anything about um so I feel like since that specific you know session I think more about that mm. it, when, I, when I'm communicating with other people. Mm. I remember you had to do a speech at a conference not long after that. We did a session specifically yeah. dedicated to creating your offer. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. Tell me about it. Tell the story. So we did a kind of a little practice maybe a week or two weeks before the talk was supposed to be. Yeah. And I remember being nervous first because <laughs> that, that was the first time I was you know practicing in front of another person right. and I remember at the end of you know saying everything that I wrote out you asked uh, what's the call to action and that was all I focused on up from that moment <laughs> to the point where I, I actually gave the talk um, making sure that 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 question was answered at some point throughout the I don't know it was like a 20 minute speech or something yeah yeah um, so I remember call to action was a kind of the biggest piece of feedback or, or, you know, 
advice that you gave me to focus on for that. I still remember what it is. Uh, that makes one of us. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember that speech. I still remember your call to action because you spoke about how the tech world was not a reflection of value that you could relate to, that you were walking Mm -hmm. into offices with million dollar chandeliers, Mm -hmm. that you were walking into offices that had omelet chefs and, (laughs) and, you know, priceless paintings on the wall and these enormous expressions of value to this organization that were not meant for you because you kind of came from a middle-class situation and kind of fought your way through school and fought your way through post-secondary and to become the person, the professional that you were. And mm-hmm. these environments were expressing value in a way that not only you couldn't relate to, but was kind of pushing you away. Yeah. And you weren't, you didn't feel invited by organizational expressions of value to participate and contribute. If anything, you were being reminded that this, in fact, was not for you, that these businesses were not for you. And so the call to action was to all tech businesses and anybody who could hear your voice was to express value better, express value that resonates with your workforce. Right. Right? This is the background where we come from. And I said, well, what does that mean? I remember asking you, what does that mean, express value better? And you said, you know what we should be doing at the company you were working for at the time is Mm -hmm. giving away code writing workshops to kids who can't afford it. We should be giving it away. And then with their permission, we should take their picture and hang them on the wall. Let's express value in the community. Let's express our relationship with the people around us and the people who want to be a part of this industry and create artifacts around that and then mount them on the wall and hang them from the chandelier and let's talk about how we express value. So you, I remember towards the end, you were rehearsing it and you were pounding your fist on the table saying, express value better. That's my demand on the tech industry. And I just remember folding the book up and saying, I'm ready to do exactly what you're saying. How do I do that? (laughs) But that's where call to action and demand. Now that your audience feels seen and heard, what's the call to action? Right. That was sweet. It was a good talk. I remember that. Yeah. Well, people seem to like it. And you've done some since, right? Yeah, I did a a couple after that. Yep. What else have you noticed after our program? Yeah, since Connection Lab. Yeah. Um, I think in in general, just there's been a change, I think, in in how I even present myself. Mm. Definitely more confident. Um, connection lab sessions will do that to you, <laughs> help, help build that confidence. And I remember when I started connection lab, um, public speaking, it, it was, I think like for everyone, it's so nerve wracking and I was a little bit afraid of it, but I knew once I would have to like give a talk or, or whatever it is, um, I could do it. It wouldn't be the best experience for me personally, but, but I, it would get done. And after Connection Lab, I feel like just that experience itself is so much easier. And the, the fair stage fight, like that still exists, but the way that those feelings, that I manage those feelings, I feel like are different. Mm. Um, and it makes it just, like I look forward to it now when, when someone's like, oh, can you, I don't know, give a talk at this company meeting mm. or, or lead this meeting or do something like that. Um, where, where you're kind of more leading whatever the conversation is versus sitting back. And then, I mean, just from the session where I had to shout all the time, I feel like now I definitely know when my voice is being heard versus not and how to identify that and then, you know, make the appropriate change. Mm. So the audience informs your process and your content. Yeah. You're co-creating it in real time. Yeah. And that, that was another big takeaway from Connection Lab, um, not focusing on the content so much in the beginning. I, I feel like since our sessions, whenever I have to present anything I fo- or even, you know, go into an important one-on-one meeting or something like that, I focus more on my audience and it's just led to better conversations. Mm. Um, And, you know, there's still some focusing on the content beforehand, like being prepared, but not obsessing over it. Yeah. So are there people in your world who are still kind of obsessed with their content? Yeah. Do they ever ask you for feedback? Yeah. Feedback on the content. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Yeah. 
because they think they're asking for feedback on how they're showing up and how relatable it is. But what they're saying is, was the content relatable? Yeah. Or what, what changes can I make to this slide so right. that it comes across um, as more relatable or easier to understand or, or something? How do you speak to that now? <laughs> Say forget the content. <laughs> 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 I, you know, give, give whatever feedback I think is appropriate for what they're doing um, on the content specifically. But then I, I try to shift and you know, get them to focus a little bit on their audience. I feel like now I ask a lot more questions about who the audience is. And then for the person I'm speaking to, it, it kind of gets them thinking about, about that because they might not have thought about their audience prior and how what their what information they're giving to this audience, um, how it could be best received. And, and it just gives some new ideas into how they could do their, their presentation. Mm. So good. Well, in a way, you become kind of a practicing facilitator. Yeah. Right? Not that you don't coach generally. I mean, I think mm -hmm. you are a very good coach, but I think this framework, I think not only do we become better communicators and better presenters, but we also become better audience. And yeah. when somebody has the guts to ask for feedback, and I, I cringe when I say that because my hope is we, we can help co-create a world where people ask for feedback all the time you know it, it's mm -hmm. just that we we collect really good feedback questions right are you getting everything you need from me is there anything you need more of is there anything you need less of do you feel seen and heard do you understand my call to action whatever these feedback questions are let's collect them and share them but i think right. we get better as audience too and i think that's critical to help create better presenters in a professional context so oh yeah i was just going to say it sounds like you're doing it yeah and even since connection lab I, when I'm in the audience, I feel like I make it a point to, you know, put the electronics away and pay attention to the presenter and who or whoever's speaking. And as I know, like they're nervous and if they have like one person they can look at Aww. and connect with, it might make it go a little bit easier and, um, and give them that little boost, you know, that they might need. And that's something I learned through Connection Lab. Like I think before that, I just wasn't aware. Mm. Yeah. So much of this is just raising our existing practice to consciousness. I'm really not mm -hmm. teaching anybody anything they don't already know. It's just under stress, which of my skills and abilities disappear first? Under stress yeah. of, oh, this presenter is just terrible. Oh, I'm cringing. And they're not terrible people, and their content isn't terrible. They just stopped breathing a week and a half ago. <laughs> and here I am checking my email and playing Tetris. Yep. So good. Amazing. You're so generous to, to, to join the show and to talk to me like this. I really appreciate it. Do you have any questions for me? I mean, I feel like I have a general question. When did you start doing this? <laughs> <laughs> so we started uh, the beginning of 2020. 2020 is a big year for Connection Lab. I feel like All right. um, we've, been, we've been, you know, market testing and lab testing the methodology for quite a while. And uh, the feedback is just tremendous and having a lot of conversations with people who are getting a ton of benefit. And, you know, this is what I want my leadership legacy to be. So the podcast yeah. is a part of talking to people who've been through the program and inviting people to listen who've been through the program, who we may not get to, you know, for a while, mm -hmm. but they want to hear people who, who've been through the same experience they have. And also people who've been to any freaking workshop. You know, not just Connection yeah. Lab, but if you've got, you deserve a freaking medal for going to a workshop because how brave and optimistic are you to go to something and try to get better? I just want to throw a bone to everybody who's trying to get better at anything in terms of communication, relationship, uh, professionalism, all that stuff. So this is a big part of that is, is the, uh, the podcast. And the other one is the facilitator development program. Have you seen the 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 module yet have i shared that with you i think you've shared some of it yeah so yeah. it's now we're doing the final touches and i'm going to share that with you as well because i'm eyeballing right. you as a potential facilitator <laughs> for connection lab no pressure no pressure sister <laughs> hilarious actually i have another question yeah. since you've been asking me I mean, questions i'm not thinking about this since you've been doing connection lab for for a while now how have you seen your practice or the way that you teach change over the years? Hmm. I would say yes. I would say yes. I would say that the collection of questions and distinctions that I've been experimenting with, I'm trusting more over time. 
So now what I used to offer as maybe this is useful. Yeah. I now offer with, to your point, much more confidence to say, here's a question that says, hey, whose needs are you in service of in this moment? You know, and when somebody who's clearly in service of their own needs and clearly convinced that they're in service of the needs of the audience, they go, ha, whose needs am I in service of? That's a really interesting question. And sometimes they'll answer in three seconds or three years. Mm -hmm. Sometimes questions like that can take a long time for people just to breathe into and go, huh, huh. You know what, Russ, I'm, I'm, I'm not in service of the needs of the person I thought I was. Yeah. And that's, that can be a salty truth. And so now I need to be with that for a while. So that leads to, do you have permission to fail? Mm -hmm. Or do you have permission to succeed wildly? Should that be what's happening? And then people have to reflect on that. And sometimes they don't. And sometimes they answer immediately. And sometimes it takes a long time for people to answer. So the way I've done this, and it's interesting because this is what's informing the podcast, is these questions, these distinctions, this six-box model. This wasn't, when you and I did our program, there was no six-box model. (laughs) It was just, how do I show up under stress? Oh, that's a really interesting question. How do I want to? Well, huh, that's really, oh, what do I want to get better at? There was kind of relationship with these these questions. And then, of course, relationships. Relationship to self, relationship to content, and relationship to audience. In the six-box model, all six boxes are touching each other. Right. They're all connected. You can use any question on any relationship. And I find the simplification of this process makes the methodology more potent for people, which is why I think now's the time for the podcast to talk about it. And also it's better than writing copy for the website. (laughs) (laughs) That's it. That's our that's our segment. You are so great for joining me. And it's just so great to hear your voice. And I can't wait until you come and be audience again, or you learn and, and start facilitating. Whatever the yeah. next steps are for us, I'm just so excited for it. So thank you so much for, awesome. for being a part of this. Well, thank you for having me. Saudi Agani, everybody. You're listening to Lab Notes, part of the Connection Lab Network. For more information about our workshops and executive development programs, email us at info at connectionlaboratory.com or go to our website at connectionlaboratory.com. So I want to welcome to the show uh, a dear friend and a spectacular professional and uh, I would say kind of uh, somebody who is influencing my design of this methodology from how many decades back? So Jim Conrad is in studio with us here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Welcome, Jim. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, How long has it been? Uh, well, we first met when you were in the, uh, I guess the radio equivalent of the mailroom, which was inside, uh, the mascot for the radio station that we were working for. Which was called? Which was called The Fox. The Fox Rocks. And, uh, one of my first, uh, gigs, I think we, <laughs> I was driving the van, you were in the Fox costume and we were going to uh, Little Italy just as the Italian national team had won the World Cup. So uh, it wasn't that, it, it wasn't exactly a calm day on uh, commercial drive here in Vancouver. Uh, thousands and thousands of screaming Italian soccer fans rocking, uh, the, you know, the, the van back and forth, you know, and uh, they're smiling. Uh, they weren't about to tip it over and then burn it. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it was an interesting, uh, I guess, introduction. That to was our relationship ra- starting. Yeah, yeah, radio promo and our, our beginning of our relationship. What was. year was that? Do you remember? Uh, that would probably be, well, the World Cup, probably 81. Something like something that. Like that. Yeah. yeah, something like that. Outstanding. Yeah. So you and I have known each other for a while. Yes. Uh, and uh, you are somebody who I talk to regularly yeah. as a friend, as a professional, as a peer. You've been audience for Connection Lab. You've seen people... Present. Yes. You have not specifically been through a Connection Lab program. I have not been through your Connection Lab program, but uh, I think uh, over the years, in in just our conversations, both in New York and here and uh, other places, uh, I have actually watched it and listened to it develop. And what uh, what really intrigued me, and what I I then therefore talk to other people about, uh, is. Uh, that unique sort of theory that you have about presentation. So, you have the Lab Notes menu in front of you. Yes. And I think all of your background here is going to be useful. Um, 
as you read that, and for those of you listening, just go on the website, uh, podcastconnectionlaboratory.com, and uh, you can check out the menu too. It has the six-box model. It has the primary questions, relationships, a few other questions and distinctions. You and I have talked about yes. everything on this menu yes. in depth over the last m- many years. Mm-hmm. What pops out of that page for you now? Uh, for me, uh, in presentation, uh, I would say, uh, how do I show up under stress? I think that's the most important question that people have to ask themselves. Why? everybody? Well, because I, I think everybody has an idea of how they... Uh, they should be, and and then all of a sudden the stress button gets pushed, and and all that stuff goes out the window, and now you're in survival mode. Yeah, right. You know the the stress of that. The red light. The red light. You know, uh, uh, especially and then for people on. I mean, I've seen people uh, not prepared, and and when the red light goes on, especially on television, have a meltdown. Yeah. Have a meltdown. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's how do I show up under stress, and then you know the, the the connecting one is okay. Well then, if I really assess how I show up under stress, you know how is that? How do I rate myself? And then uh, how do I want to? <laughs> you know, okay. So what? I mean, I want to be I want to be professional. I want to sound like I'm. I know what I'm talking about. Right. I want to be able to present whatever the content is in a manner that that. That that is professional, but sometimes I think people get caught up in that and they forget about their audience. Yeah. So, what's the difference between leadership and authority, Jim Conrad? Uh, I think it's being vulnerable. Nice. Uh, I think I, I, you know, if if I was a manager, I mean, and I'm I'm just, you know, I, I haven't been in a corporate environment for many, 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 many. That's years. how I describe you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but I do speak with um, people who are. Yeah. And yeah, I, I I get a sense of you know, and I, and it's funny because when I'm doing a recording session, uh, part of my uh, mo is I always just because I love the people that I work with, yeah, and I and I've managed to cultivate uh, some pretty decent clients for long long periods of time by just being interested in in who they are, curious. Uh, and, and, you know, where they live and what their interests are. And, uh, you know, the recording engineer that I work with in Columbus, Ohio, mm-hmm. does, he, you know, he owns a couple of apartments and does renovations and he's just got married. Yeah. So before the session, before mm-hmm. we call the client, we, we talk about that. Amazing. So thank you for participating. Thank you for contributing. Do you have any questions for me? Uh, what do you want to get better at, Russ? Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. I want to get better at trusting the process. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, I mean as a facilitator, under stress, sometimes I will say to myself, here, let me learn this for you. Yeah. Right? And then I interrupt their learning process to try and speed it up, and all I do is slow it down or block it. Yeah. So one of the things I'm trying to get better at is trusting the process. I'm trying to get better at breathing. Yeah. Because I find under stress, I stop breathing. Yes. So that's one of the things I'm trying to get better at. Uh, I'm always trying to get better at listening. I'm also trying to get better at meeting people where they are. Mm -hmm. Because it's not enough for me to look at them and say, it's obvious what you need to get better at. That is not useful. Mm -hmm. What I need to do is see the world and what they're looking at from their perspective. And the set of competencies that it takes to meet people where they are is elusive. Because each person is different. Mm -hmm. Sometimes these people under stress are aggressive and Mm -hmm. hostile and angry. They're hurt. Sometimes they're reluctant and sad and quiet and don't want to say anything. Everybody is different and unique. And meeting them where they are, each person requires different competencies. So what I want to get better at is assessing that quickly and meeting people where they are as, as quickly and effectively as I can. Now, what is what is the best way when you walk into a room to create a safe space for that process to occur? Um, treat it like it's inconsequential. Yeah. What we're about to do is is just we're just horsing around. Yeah, we're just playing a game. We're just right. Treat it lightly. Yeah, 
if I embody an experience where it's really not very consequential, what we're about to do, it's not a waste of time. If nothing else, you'll be entertained. Yes. But let's treat this lightly. And then people will take, will follow me. They will breathe. They will breathe. If I breathe, and especially if I'm transparent about saying, I'm going to take a breath because under stress, I tend to stop breathing. People in the audience who haven't breathed because they know they're coming to a Connection Lab workshop, yeah. they will go, oh, you're practicing this too. Yeah, you're in the process you're in, while you're You're, you're, you're a participant yeah. in this, and that builds safety and trust. Yeah. Also, something else I do in the room is when I ask them, what's the best thing that can happen in this workshop? And people will start with a joke. Oh, win the lottery. I'll write that down. Win the lottery. I write down exactly what they say. I don't paraphrase. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want to be rich. No, no, I didn't say that. That's a way to distance people yeah. is to paraphrase. I write down what they say. And that way they feel seen and heard. And they start, what they're doing is testing the boundaries of trust. Can I trust this guy? Yep. Can I trust this experience? And this has been learned over time. Uh, but this process invites them to inform what's going to happen over the next few hours. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, my God, this is really. And that, so to your point, out of the gate, the essence of trust and feeling seen and heard, I'm trying to model for them what I'm going to ask them to do. I'm trying to practice what I'm going to ask them to practice. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for contributing and your friendship and your guidance and help this whole process. I really appreciate it. That's this episode of Lab Notes. I am so grateful that you tuned in. I want to thank our guests, Kathy Howley. I want to thank Sadia Ganey from uh, Plainfield, New Jersey. She was great today. It's just so great to hear her voice as well. And I want to thank my friend Jim Conrad for coming down and sitting in studio with me and, and talking about his experience of this work and how it's affected our relationship and everything else. I just think these are great conversations and I'm so grateful for you for tuning in. I'm so grateful for them. And listen, if you want to participate, I invite you to do so. Send us an email at guestplease at connectionlaboratory.com or you can text us at 646-780-9946. Let us know what you're hearing that's interesting or what you want to hear more of or less of. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. This is Lab Notes, the Connection Lab podcast. Thanks for listening to Lab Notes, the Connection Lab podcast. For more information about our workshops and executive development programs, you can email us at info at connectionlaboratory.com or go to our website, connectionlaboratory.com.